Um, okay, so this is going to come as a shock to everybody, but um, I'd like to start with the book on, of Vices and Virtues uh, and its background. Uh, this very medieval series of texts involves a Middle English translation from around 1375 of the Dominican friar Laurent Sandevois, composed in French in 1279 for Philip the Bold, the King of France, a work which itself was an adaptation of the Latin Summa de Viciis by Laurent's fellow Dominican William Peraldus, composed around 1236. So Latin to English via French, that's a really well-traveled route, uh, route of transmission, but that doesn't mean that everything uh, remains the same along the road. Peraldus's handbook is a massive compilation giving Dominican novices every minute detail they need to know to hear a confession and compose sermons on the seven deadly sins and the sin of the tongue. The vernacular texts have a bit more, have a bit more, um, uh, have a bit more consideration for the amount of time their lay audiences can spend with moral theology, condensing appreciably the material on the sins and other catechal, catechetical pieces like the Ten Commandments or the Paternoster and so on. But all three texts know the wiles of merchants and warn about them in the treatment of the sin of avarice, and all three texts emphasize different and unique aspects of these retailing ruses. What they present as part of the branch of greed known as merchandising amounts to deceitful practices, that is to say, hiding the reality of a product, manipulating the sensory perception of its quantity or quality. The third type of merchandising theft occurs, writes Peraldus, when a person contrives to make something heavier that must be sold by weight, as those people do who moisten wool. The seventh type of merchandising fraud occurs, writes Friar Laurent, when one makes an item one is selling appear better than it is, as cloth merchants do who choose to sell their cloth in dimly lit locations. And in the Middle English text, <clears throat> the third type of misuse of weights and measures occurs when a man has an accurate weight or a true measuring instrument, but he weighs or measures falsely and plays a trick, such as innkeepers and those who measure cloth and those who weigh spices and other such men. The marketplace is indeed an enticing and pleasurable, that is to say dangerous place for sensation, it comes as no surprise to see that Anselm of Canterbury, writing at the end of the 11th century, could find a market the most dangerous space for a monk, a location furthest from the surveillance apparatus of the monastery, because it was possible to give free reign there to the vice of sensual curiosity. Anselm distinguishes one of the categories of vitium curiositatis, that is the vice of excessive curiosity, by how many senses are involved in committing an act of unregulated sensation. When he describes the sin of seeing, touching, and tasting different spices in the marketplace simply to know what each one is like, we get an impression of how attractive they must have been made to appear to customers and how overwhelmed ascetics were in the riot of sensations the market presented them with. And of course, things have only gotten much more alluring since Anselm. A great deal of attention has been given to the sensory input in marketing and its growth and subtlety. Changes made to enhance products for sale have altered urban architecture and created new forms of sociality. Writing of the bewitching commodities offered in the forerunners of department stores, namely the arcades of 19th century Paris, just to create a bridge between a previous uh, <laughs> presentation. Uh, Luca Vercelloni has noted that the new commercial spaces called for attractive display to emphasize the seductive power of commodities, and this in turn boosted a form of voyeurism that revolved around the urge to acquire. 
to be seen and thus to become desirable, an object required window dressing. The outcome was shopping as a socially shared pastime. David Howes and Constance Klassen point out that contemporary big box stores have traded sensual experience for functional efficiency, but they also describe the sensory support and appeals to the senses that make for a sensuous shopping experience, which retailers have once again begun to utilize to maintain a customer base. As Adam Mack and Mark Smith have shown, for example, the desire to more deeply involve the senses in the marketplace has led to changes in produce displays in American supermarkets, and sensory commodification continues to underline appeals for sometimes childlike responses to consumer product design elicited in ubiquitous advertising. The sound of safety in a closing automobile door, the smell of a new car sprayed from an aerosol can in a used car, the thrill of imagining oneself racing up a mountainside, in an otherwise curiously and completely isolated wilderness. While scholars have examined sensory enhancement, uh, while those scholars who have examined sensory enhancement surely are correct in taking it for granted that the goods made to appear so enchanting to customers are not essentially other than what re retailers offer to the senses, I want to examine uh, sensory obfuscation, in particular in commerce, but also elsewhere. After all, some of the same techniques used to enthrall our senses to affect a sale or persuade us can also be used to deceive us. What we are presented with here are very much problems, misperceptions, and perceptual errors, uh, but they are ultimately not of the kind so extensively examined in a fantastic collection of essays dedicated to theories of perceptual problems edited recently by Brian Glenny and Philippe. That is to say, even when we can in general assume that the requirements for veridical perception are met by the perceiving subject, we have to recognize that this sensory apparatus has intentionally been redirected in order to guarantee an unreliable result in apprehending the object of perception. What ensues can be called illusory, or in the case of the Mercers who show their wares in dimly lit locations, a transmission error or distortion due to the less than optimal medium required for perception. But the fact is that the sensory environment has been deliberately manipulated to create the, this illusion. In the examples I'm working with here, sensory control has been directed towards deception. The sensory obfuscation reported in the Book of Vices and Virtues continued beyond the Middle Ages. In 1583, the Puritan Philip Stubbs um, complained in a pamphlet about the abusive practices of Elizabethan shoemakers. Sometimes they will sell you calves leather for cow leather, horse hides for ox hides, and truly I think rotten sheepskins for good substantial and durable stuff. The inward sole of the shoe commonly shall be no better than a cat skin. The heels of the shoes shall be little better. Nearly a century later, Mr. Horner, a character in William Witcherly's The Country Wife, probably performed by the King's Company at the Theater Royal in Drury Lane on January 12, 1675, denigrates Mr. Pinchwife's careful choice of marriage to a woman from outside London by comparing this type of selection to falling prey to the sharp practices well known to occur at a notorious market near the city, Horner says, pshaw, that's all one. That grave circumspection in marrying a country wife is like refusing a deceitful pampered Smithfield jade to go and be cheated by a friend in the country. In the Middle Ages, scribes had been condemned for showing calligraphically beautiful initial folios of their work and reproducing a text ordered by a customer but then for doing the rest of the copying in hurried and sloppy handwriting. Booksellers as well drew the ire of critics long after the invention of the printing press. Restoration satirists were indignant at book, at book merchants for using a technique reported already from the medieval text, namely showing their work 
in less than optimal lighting, but also by using jargon-filled talk to sell books. And these types of accusations against booksellers continued into the 18th century. Regulations against such activity in European kingdoms were part of what Michel Foucault recognized as the increased participation of the royal administration in the prosecution of infractions. Sensory marketing now offers contemporary shoppers all the more possibilities to be deceived from falsely representing goods as original or new when they are knockoffs or reconditioned to making portions of food look larger than what is actually served from the use of inferior materials and clothing passed off as something they are not to all-you-can-eat buffets of tasteless food. At some point, you might think that this deceptive control of the senses is no longer just the pur purview of moral drowsing. You, you might think there really ought to be a law. <laughs> and guess what? There is. And in fact, there are laws against deceptive trade practices. In almost every state in the United States and in many other countries, which is to say that in the locations where a central authority has stepped in, one can say that a political will had developed to legislate how our senses can be manipulated, no matter how spotty the enforcement of these laws may be at times. Control of the ability to deceive through sensation is thus a political matter. But there is more to it than this. As Bruno Latour noted, the body as a social actant exists at the interface of things, including retail commodities, and the sensory experiences of things that together form part of the life of sensory communities, which are defined by them. These communities are groups, stable or ad hoc, in which people are linked cohesively through norms of interpretation of sensory experience and subscribe to the same valuation or devaluation of those sensory experiences and the cultural productions of these communities, including the products of com uh, commerce. The collective responses of the individuals in the sensory community make up its sensorium or sensory model of conscious and unconscious associations that functions in society to create meaning in individuals' complex web of continual and interconnected sensory perceptions. But these associations are not spread evenly through the sensorium. They experience what Jacques Rancière has called a distribution of the sensible. This regime of perception is also properly political in that it reflects the development and exercise of status, authority, and power uh, that goes with them within a social order where modes of perception and strategies that direct perceptive attentions determine, as Davide has maintained, the nature, shape, and form an appearance can take. The political and sensation is understood by Panagia as the rendering sensible of a previously insensible, and by Ranciere as a process that makes visible what had been excluded from the perceptual field and makes audible what used to be inaudible. Sensory obfuscation performs just the opposite movement, masking and distorting the sensory object, invalidating the interpretive norms of the sensory community, blocking veridical perception at the interface between the body, senses, and things, creating the, the appearance of engagement with the senses only to deceive the senses. And this, too, is a political act namely to narrow participation in true perception, controlling access to any sensation that might affect change. No wonder it takes a centralized authority to withstand the centrifugal force of sensory masking to control those striving to distort sensation. Now, it is apparent that there are as many theories of state formation as there are states to theorize about. Still, Michel Foucault's idea of governmentality offers an opening to admit sensory elements into the discussion, his view that the power of the state is everywhere, in its institutions, its subjects, and in the control and production of knowledge, which, though he does not say this explicitly, will include sensorially mediated knowledge. Further, recognizing the importance of cultural factors in relation to how 
the state acquires a reality in everyday life provides a way for us to understand the power of state institutions to form and regulate, even in coercive ways, the conditions that lead to sensory control. If then a state is produced in everyday encounters at the local level, in those contexts where the state bodies, representatives, and individuals and groups interact, then a guarantee of the veridicality of perceptions at the interface of things in the human senses within the expectations of sensory communities is a constitutive element of how state formation and the development of the sensorium are interrelated. Regulations to control unscrupulous sharp practices have belonged and continue to belong to the sensorial functions of the state. Of course, these regulations work with varying success, but they are, in general, in place, though new challenges appear daily. And for the rest of this uh, presentation, I want to briefly mention two of these trends uh, related, at least, to what we might understand as sharp practices, one in the realm of the, um, uh, one in the realm the medieval text understood as merchandising, the other not. As a recent article in the New York Times noted, retail and service establishments in Midtown Manhattan, everything from men's and women's clothing stores to barber shops, have now begun to serve alcohol in trendy in-house uh, bars. Department stores and shopping malls long ago included restaurants and food courts to keep the customers fed, satisfied, uh, and in the vicinity of the stores. Uh, but these new features are full-service bars serving only alcohol. Their ambience is meant to create a new atmosphere for sociability to flourish in the environment of women's sh uh, shoes, bathrobes, lingerie, and other product placements. The publicly stated idea is to intertwine the retail experience with the social, but here and there the unarticulated goal of creating sensory distortion at the bar emerges. As David Kim, uh, Nordstrom's director of food and beverage in Manhattan, is quoted as saying in the Times article, what better way is there to shop for shoes than sipping on champagne? The subtext of shopping under the influence becomes clear in what a customer visiting New York from Nashville told the Times reporter. For having one's senses dulled by alcohol before the retail experience, quote, might give people a little more courage to buy something they wouldn't otherwise, close quote. Indeed, nothing says savvy shopping like three martinis. <laughs> Second, let me play for you, if we ever be able to hear it or not, um, the, um, uh, a, a recent addition to YouTube. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you, and stay woke, bitches. <laughs> Deep fakes like this are spreading and getting more sophisticated and more difficult to detect. The software is apparently easy to use, and while algorithms and blockchain techniques have been developed to spot them, their distortions will continue to affect politics, social media, and elsewhere. Their effects have already been felt because of pornographic deepfakes of celebrities, especially on Reddit. 
Is it time for the state to exercise sensorial control in either of these two areas? I suspect there will be many who will oppose that in the USA, and so I can end only by saying that until intentional sensory distortions produced by a retail happy hour or deep fake software are the subject of more diligent scrutiny, we must remain vigilant. Or in the immortal words of President Jordan Peele, stay woke, bitches.